opportunity to talk today. It is a lovely day and it's a great venue for this. All the coffee shops and everything are available and open. Um, look, I'm here as a representative of the Australian Electric Vehicle Association. Uh, that was established by EV conversion enthusiasts way back in 1973. So EVs have been around for a long time and as you know well before that. I'm also quite enthusiastic for the ecosystem of emissions free renewable energy and EVs uh, and the synergies that bring. Now, while the topics around electric vehicles are numerous, I've only got about 20, 25 minutes here. So I felt it important uh, to address the real life concerns many people might have when considering the purchase of an electric vehicle. I'm not wanting to convince anyone to buy a new electric car, uh, but I would say that it's important that you do not buy another internal combustion engine car. And the reasons will become apparent as we go. Uh, it's a big step to buy into any new technology. As we, uh, as we may think it is, uh, still unproven, and it can still feel very unfamiliar to us. That's exactly how we felt when we bought our first EV back in 2025. So, given the time constraints, I've chosen uh, to look at, sorry, so, uh, so given the time constraints, I've chosen three concerns to look at that I think cross most people's minds. Uh, battery longevity, uh, upfront costs, and the environmental benefit. And there's a lot of misinformation and so forth around about some of these things, so uh, hopefully I can clarify things in a simple manner. I'm happy to take questions uh, around these areas or other things after the talk, but I'm reading this because I'll love an hour, otherwise I'll take 45 minutes instead of 25. Um, so please approach me later. Let's first look at uh, battery longevity. So uh, like the internal combustion engine, batteries degrade over time. And as I see it, there are three main reasons for this degradation process. Calendar aging, excessive heat, and the capacity and life cycle factors. I'll explain these in a little more detail. So first, simple thing to accept is that EV traction batteries, regardless of their type or their chemistry, will very gradually age over time, regardless of usage, usage patterns. This is simply called calendar aging. The aging process can be likened to rust on exposed steel. It is inevitable, and there is little you can do about this factor, but it is extremely gradual. It can, however, be hastened by excessive heat. Excessive heat of a lithium-ion battery will contribute to its rate of degradation on top of the calendar aging. Most likely, this will be caused by one, very frequent fast charging, or two, very frequent and fast discharging. Um, as in frequent fast charging and frequent extreme acceleration. Now most people who own EVs do, uh, do, do not do these things frequently enough to have a noticeable impact upon the battery. And so they are largely non-issues unless you want to race your EV or do things like that. But to attenuate these potentials, most electric cars these days are built with very effective thermal battery management systems, specifically designed to protect the battery from excessive heat. These are various, ranging from coolant circulating between the individual cells within the battery pack, to air-conditioned battery pack casings, to active air cooling systems through the battery pack. Twelve years ago, early technology EVs like the 2010 Nissan Leaf had no active thermal management systems for their batteries, resulting in several warranty claims, particularly in Arizona and some parts of Australia, where the already high atmospheric temperatures of summer unmasked the inadequacy of not having an active thermal management system for the battery. Research undertaken by the Plug in America Association showed a clear correlation between premature, premature battery degradation and average summer temperatures are greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the US. That's about 32 degrees Celsius here. Prompting a number of warranty claims. Didn't happen elsewhere in the world. Here in Queensland, we are clearly vulnerable to these average summertime temperatures as well. So the first take home point 
uh, I would like to make ensure that any EV you may choose to purchase has an active thermal management system for the battery. And for what it's worth, my advice would be for a liquid cooled system, and most UVs have this. Finally, it is important to understand the notion of life cycles of a battery. One life cycle of a battery refers to it being fully charged and then fully discharged once. With, notable, with one notable exception, most lithium-ion batteries have about 1,500, 1,500 life cycles before they are degraded to 80% capacity relative to being new. So what does this mean in practice? Well, if I have a car with a small battery, let's say 20 kilowatt hour battery, I might get 100 kilometers of range out of one life cycle with normal everyday driving, air conditioning, working, etc. That 100 kilometers multiplied by the expected 1500 uh, life cycles will mean that I can expect to get about 1500 kilometers of use from that battery before it reaches 8% of its original capacity. But that doesn't mean that battery has failed or it is no good. It just means I may have only 80 kilometers of range available on a full charge instead of the original 100 kilometers. If I do the average daily drive of most Australians, that's about 40 kilometers per day according to the uh, uh, Bureau of Statistics, then this vehicle will still meet my daily needs very adequately for many years beyond that. But if I have a larger battery, let's say an 80 kilowatt hour battery, uh, being four times larger than our just mentioned example, I may get about 400 kilometers of range from one life cycle. This means that 400 kilometers multiplied by the 1500 kilometer life cycles would mean 600,000 kilometers of use before the battery reaches 80% of its original capacity. And even then, it will have over 320 kilometers of range per charge. So battery life cycle and battery capacity are interlinked factors when it comes to battery longevity. This is also why battery warranties are expressed the way they are. As a minimum of 70% capacity at 8 years or 160,000 kilometres, whichever comes first for most cars. You'll notice there on the bottom, the long range Tesla, uh, the warranty is 8 years or 192,000 kilometres because it has a larger battery. This is an indicator of the factors of calendar ageing and life cycles underpinning battery longevity. And I think these warranties also speak to the resilience of these batteries and would certainly not be offered if there was risk of numerous claims. And EVs have been around long enough now to see how this is playing out in real life. This graph shows the rate of degradation of batteries in early Tesla vehicles relative to distance travel. You can clearly see the correlation between battery capacity on the vertical axis in percentage and kilometres travelled on the horizontal axis. So we've got some cars here with over 200,000 kilometres and by average, they're still not down to, uh, they still haven't degenerated down to 90% of, of capacity. This second graph is similar but in miles, showing the battery capacity retention using aggregated data from all Tesla Model X and X vehicles relative to the straight line straight red line indicating uh, the uh, industry's 70% warranty threshold. Clearly, they are very resilient and probably degrade no more significant, significantly than the degradation of an internal combustion engine. It's that you just don't pay attention to the range left uh, in degradation of an internal combustion engine. But you will be filling it more often per kilometres after that distance. So, key points I'd like to make about battery longevity are this. Excessive heat, calendar aging, and life cycles all contribute concurrently to normal battery degradation, but the technology is nonetheless very resilient. As take home advice, I would say, expect about one to 2% battery degradation per year of ownership with normal operating conditions. Make sure any car you buy has an effective thermal management system for the battery, 
particularly in, in uh, Queensland. And buy the larger battery if there is an option. So some of the cars out there, you can get a small battery or a large battery, the same car. All else being equal, if there is a choice, my advice would be to buy the larger battery as it uses fewer life cycles per kilometre truck and therefore will have more life. I now want to look at the, uh, oh, well, moving on to upfront costs. These are probably the main blockage for many people who are keen to move to an electric car. While in the luxury and premium segments of the market, EVs are close to, if not now already at price parity, it is certainly not the case for most people's budgets. I want to focus on the lower market segment where we are, where, where we are still away off price parity. I've taken two cars that are essentially equal except their drivetrains, except for their drivetrains, giving a like-for-like -like comparison of electric vehicle versus ICE. So the Hyundai Kona is a common vehicle, you'll see plenty out there, and you'll see the price for the long range, I've chosen the long range one here, which is the most expensive electric uh, version. You'll see the price for the long range electric version with the larger 64 kilowatt hour battery pack is almost $20,000 more than the equivalent petrol version. Wow, big jump up. But like many new era technologies, despite higher upfront costs, they avoid the higher back end costs of fossil fuels. In this comparison, I've taken manufacturer claimed, a manufacturer specified claims on efficiencies and emissions, used my own electricity tariffs from Innova Energy, and nominated 2.2 uh, $2.20 per litre petrol, which was the billboarded price when I started putting this presentation together, and likely to be the price or even more moving forward, especially once the fuel excise tax, well, especially once the full fuel excise tax is reapplied. You'll note that the back end costs of running the petrol version are over 500% higher than the EV. And that has not factored in general servicing costs of oils, filters, spark plugs, timing belts, etc., that the internal combustion engine additionally requires. Over a conservative operational life of 200,000 kilometres, the internal combustion version would cost over $27,000 in petrol alone, and probably over $30,000 on top of its purchase price if we add in routine service costs. That data does not factor in the environmental costs either. The internal combustion version will pump about 20 times its own weight of CO2 into the atmosphere over 200,000 kilometres. So despite higher upfront costs, the electric vehicle is far more cost effective over whole of life comparison. But the upfront costs are also falling fairly quickly. This graph shows the relationship between purchase price and range back in 2015 when we purchased our first electric vehicle. There were four cars available in Australia then, the Mitsubishi Naev, the Nissan Leaf, the BMW i3, each of those with about 100 to 130 kilometres of range, and then the grossly more expensive Tesla Model S, which you can see off there to the right. Last year, I had an all new all newer EVs in the Australian market. While there are still few under the $50,000 benchmark, there are more than there used to be, uh, there has been phenomenal growth in value from the $50,000 to $100,000 uh, uh, segment. Of note, range for dollars spent has about trebled in that short period of time. So if you just have a look at, if I just go back, so you'll see in that segment there that I've blacked out, which is the, um, you can't see the bottom of the screen. So these are $50,000 segments. Don't worry about the right so, um, so you'll see that uh, there, were, there were three cars in that in that price range, and and their range on the left on the uh, vertical column. Um, and so if we if we just look at the value for the, the range for, for price, it's, it's uh, changed significantly in a short, very short period of time. So that's what it was only seven years ago. That's what it is now. 
Um, so what does this mean? It means the price of batteries, the dearest component of a new electric vehicle, has fallen significantly. And all predictions are that this will continue at a fast rate, enabling more vehicles to become available in the under $50,000 segment. And boy, will we see a shift then. So, key points I'd like to make about the prices of EVs are this. One, the internal combustion engine cars has about 500% increase in running costs compared to equivalent EVs. And as a result, the conventional car is significantly more expensive over whole of life. And that basically applies, though, to the, uh, to the lower part of the segment. In the upper market segments, EVs are already a price parity. You know, if you want to buy a, a Tesla Model 3 or a, or a BMW 3 Series, they're in the same, same price category. So, so moving on now to the last section, uh, where there's a lot of myth and misinformation out there. Uh, which is the environmental stuff. You recall uh, earlier that I mentioned the CO2 outputs of the petrol cone are over 200,000 kilometres being about 29 tonnes. And that's just for one car. Most people don't appreciate the greenhouse gas emissions uh, when they are stated uh, as grams per kilometre. So the stickers on cars all by the law have to state grams per kilometre of emissions of a vehicle. It seems pretty benign in that guise, but calculated out for the uh, life of the car, and most cars are putting out at least 20 times their weight in carbon into the atmosphere over their lifetime. But focusing on the tailpipe emissions of the internal combustion engine, which is the bit in red there, um, which is all that has, been, has occurred over the past 50 years as part of the issue. To get a proper comparison of environmental benefit of the electric car versus the internal combustion car, we need to look at what are called cradle-to-grave factors, an analysis of the greenhouse gas emissions of a vehicle's full life cycle, including not just its operational phase, but also its production and disposal phases. So I've looked at some of these life cycle analyses, many completed by manufacturers themselves. First, Renault produced their Fluence model in diesel, petrol and fully electric versions. Like our Kona comparison, this is also helpful as it uses like-for-like -like vehicles for comparison. In Renault's cradle-to-grave analysis, including over 150,000 kilometres of travel, the electric vehicle, uh, the electric version of the Fluence had only two-thirds the total emissions of the petrol version if you charged it from the then 2008 electricity mix of the UK. And only a third of the emissions if you charged it from the French grid, from the French grid, which being predominantly nuclear powered was relatively emissions free. So, you know, these people would say, yeah, but what about the cost of, uh, of manufacturing and what about the disposal and so forth? These are full lifetime analysis which take all that into account. Similarly, in 2014, Mercedes-Benz compared the cradle-to-grave emissions of the all-electric and petrol versions of their B-Class vehicle. Again, the EV's carbon foot footprint was about two-thirds that of the petrol-powered car, if charged from an EU electricity mix at the time, and only one-third of the petrol car's emissions if charged from renewables, in this case hydropower. So in that, the petrol version is on the right-hand side, uh, and then the, the two left-hand columns are electric versions, one, one charged on an e, uh, EU electricity mix and the other one on hydropower. So again, if, if you have an EV and you charge it on emissions-free renewables, you're looking at around a third of the emissions of a uh, petrol car. There is a wealth of other research available too, too much to produce here that gives similar results. This example shows the whole of life emissions of the Nissan Leaf over 150,000 kilometres across a number of nations along the bottom, across a number of nations uh, compared to the whole of life emissions for the average European car and the Toyota Hybris, uh, Toyota Prius, sorry, Hybris, the Toyota Prius, both represented on the left of the chart. 
It seems to matter little where in the world the leaf is used, its emissions are significantly less. This is despite the battery manufacturer emissions in bright blue at the top, not real bright here, but these sections here are the additional emissions in producing the car uh, because of the battery. It seems to matter little where in the um, sorry, it seems to matter little where in the world the leaf is used, its emissions are significantly less. This is despite the battery manufacturing emissions in bright blue giving the leaf a higher carbon footprint in the manufacturing phase than conventional cars. The same study also looked at the Tesla Model 3 with the large battery across the same criteria. You will note that this car, due to its larger battery, has a larger carbon footprint in the manufacturing phase than the leaf. So if we just compare the two, you'll see how the manufacturing of the Tesla is uh, significantly more than the leaf because the leaf has a smaller battery. Um, so it has a, an even larger carbon footprint in the manufacturing phase than the leaf, but is still substantially better off over whole of life than the internal combustion engine cars, car and the hybrid it is compared against. In fact, Tesla in their recent 2021 impact report stated the manufacturing process of the Tesla Model 3 and Model Y Currently, currently results in slightly higher greenhouse gas emissions than an equivalent internal combustion vehicle. However, based on the global weighted average electricity mix, Model 3 and Model Y have lower lifetime emissions than the equivalent ice after travelling only 6,500 6, miles, or that's about 10,000 kilometres. And part of the reason is this, the Tesla like many other automotive manufacturers now are growing the utilisation of emissions-free energy in their manufacturing processes. These are images of just a couple of the Tesla, Tesla factories, plastered with solar panels. And they're huge complexes uh, with a lot of area. So the main points I'd like to make on the environmental, be environmental benefit of EVs, and I've just looked at the you know, climate issues, I haven't looked at health issues at all, uh, are these. Over whole of life, EVs produce 30 to 70 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions than conventional vehicles. Well, we can put that another way, which is a little more potent. Uh, the internal combustion car puts out about 50 percent to 200 percent more greenhouse gas emissions than the equivalent electric vehicle in full cradle of the grave analysis. So we tend to sort of benchmark everything against the internal combustion engine, but flip the numbers around and uh, the internal combustion car suddenly looks uh, even more dirty. Importantly, the benefits of EVs increase over time with broader decarbonisation of the energy sector. They become less polluting in production, they become less polluting in operation and in disposal as energy grids continue to decarbonise. Even on an individual basis, using renewables for charging in the operational phase of car ownership has, used, has huge environmental and cost benefits. This shows our personal total energy consumption over six years for our house, which is in blue on that graph, and our EV, which is shown in green, against our energy generation, which is shown in yellow. That's all from a six kilowatt rooftop solar system. You can readily see that, despite we, us using the grid as a, as a big battery, you might say, to manage peak and nighttime loads, our modest 6 kilowatt solar system is able to completely offset our energy consumption for both house and car. We travel about 20,000 uh, kilometres a year. That's pretty amazing stuff to me, and certainly disruptive of centralised and ever expensive fossil fuel business models. So finally, I hope this presentation has been somewhat informative. I've tried to make it simple enough to be digestible. I appreciate that uh, a lot of the, the technology and a lot of the language around EVs, you know, kilowatts, kilowatt hours and so forth, are foreign to a lot of people. So, um, so I hope it's been somewhat informative. I'm not here to convince anyone to buy a new EV, but I will definitely say that if you are considering a new car, do not purchase a new internal combustion vehicle as you are immediately and inescapably captured by the fossil fuel industry. 
with all their ever ongoing and ever increasing costs, both economic and environmental. Once you've got that car, they've got you. You have no choice. Even if you sell that car to someone else, it will continue to pollute and exacerbate our climate issues for years beyond until it is scrapped. Remember, if you buy an ice, ice just means internal combustion engine, if you buy an ice, you will always pay twice. So thank you. Uh, I don't know if you want any questions or um, you want to move on, Ron, but thank you very much for your listening.